what triggered you to begin studying the ancient mysteries in the first place? I heard something about uh, you were at a protest or something in Ireland and, and something caught your eye and things went from there? No, um, what happened was that uh, I guess uh, I think that it started because um, family members, uh, people within my family, including my mother, were very much involved with the New Age movement. So I was sort of plunged in to meet a lot of key figures uh, in that movement. And as time developed, you know, I really studied them. I would always describe my life, whether it's with my Eastern side of family and their whole, you know, Sikhism, or whether it's with my father and his communism and his Marxism, whether it's with my mother and her New Age, uh, you know, uh, connections. These people always were uh, out to teach me or teach, the, you know, their, their followers or whatever. I was learning, but the trouble was that I was learning a lot more than they wanted to teach. Being very objective and highly critical, I would learn things that in, in the end would separate me uh, from what they were doing. And some of these people were close. They were, you know, practically family. And I had, uh, through the years, we're talking about a 20-year, you know, apprenticeship in a way. And I started to see with my own senses, my own eyes, my own experience, that reality was actually the opposite in many cases of what they were talking about. I guess it was more perceptible when, when I was hanging around with my father and listening to him because his was a strictly Marxist, communistic, he would call it humanistic, uh, you know, background. And we were brought up to despise capitalism and to despise all conservatives. And um, he did talk a lot about the Jewish conspiracy at points, but he had very limited knowledge of it. Uh, he was... If you had ever pointed out anything conspiratorial to him, he would have completely negated it or said that it's not a conspiracy, it's just a lot of greedy, materialistic, corporate, you know, imperialistic types of people. He would have given the usual communistic left-wing rhetoric. And, of course, my own experience started to realize that this was total bunkum because, as G. Edward Griffin has pointed out, how come all the leading communists are basically some of the wealthiest people in the world? That's number one. And number two, how is it that Stalin and, and Trotsky and Lenin are some of the world's worst psychopathic murderers and Mao Zedong and, 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 and uh, Ho Chi Minh and all his great heroes, including Marshal Tito, all the people that he lionized, you know, were mass murderers. And when you read up their biographies, then I noticed that he had myopia. So it started in those days that to contradict what my even closest relatives were believing in can leave you in a wilderness, but what it does is it helps you to realize that, look, if you expose one or two falsehoods with these people, big, big, big ones, why believe the rest of what they're talking about? And, um, you know, my father, for instance, all the days of his life used to have a bust of Lenin on his uh, mantelpiece. I mean, this is an Irish uh, man. He was, he was uh, non-violent in the sense that his struggle and his objective was, of course, it was uh, non-violence. He didn't believe in, he, he didn't sympathize with the Republican IRA or anything like that. He didn't believe that killing was the solution. He wanted to work strictly within the political framework. But basically, the rhetoric and the kinds of philosophical ideas, uh, let's, let's point to another one. And I never, had, I never could bring this up to him because he was the kind of person who would not listen to anything that contradicted him. He was very opinionated. But for instance, say I had, for instance, played devil's advocate and told him that how come it is that the real author of Da Capital, the real author of the, the Communist Manifesto, Frederick Engels, was not only a wealthy, um, super wealthy um, Jewish um, financier or, or industrialist in the north of England who had children down his mines. He, he actually had industries and he had mines and all sorts of cotton industries and what have you. This is meant to be the arch, cap the arch communist, literally the co-author of, of Das Kapital, if you, if you will, uh, one of the leading communists that they, all the commies look up to, was actually an incredibly, you know, um, capitalistic person who children were dying in the mines working for his corporations in the north of England. This is absolutely you know, provable. Again, things like that you could never bring up, not to mention the campaign of genocide that took place in Russia and so forth and so on. So it was, it was a really good way for me. And those are just, these are just a few examples. I've got examples of that right across the board with my mother's New Age connections and friends. Oh, and well, you know, and the whole New Age thing, talking about uh, humanists uh, a minute ago, that ties in through uh, theosophy and uh, the whole positive thinking movement, uh, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, mind control. And it's very much um, the, all of these uh, organizations which started off as sects that were mostly, as you say, theosophical or religious, let's say, or pan-religious, slowly, slowly, slowly they were infiltrated and they were made into political organizations. This is what happened with theosophy. It's eventually what happened with uh, other movements uh, like Rudolf Steiner's organizations. Uh, not originally. I don't believe these were originally anything to do with politics. That can be proven. They were actually just research institutions and they you know, had a little bit of religion uh, and theosophy tied into it and what have you. And I think that was quite benign. But slowly, uh, these things again became politicized. They were infiltrated because the, uh, I have a belief, you see, that all the, the um, control establishment, the Black Lodge at the highest level, is extremely frightened of any kind of um, uh, philosophical or theological freedom, in the sense that even a group that teaches man to look to his own selfhood, look to his own uh, individual morality, they're actually scared of that. They want institutionalized religions. And if they find a particular sect or even a particular religion, that looks like it's not 
going to go there, they will try to institutionalize it or they'll try to completely control it and destroy it. And so this has to, has to be borne in mind. I'm not a fan of those people who have just, you know, a brush, a tar brush for all of these different organizations because I've studied them. A lot of the people who debunk these organizations haven't bothered to really read or study their works. I have. Just uh, concluding, I would say that in my background, it became quite obvious then that there's an answer to all these contradictions. I knew the questions. And I can say after I spent some time in America studying it, then I started to find the answers. The pieces of the jigsaw started to come together until I realized basically what I realize now. And that is, I don't care what you call yourself, a jihadist, an Islamist, a, 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 a Zionist, a, a Nazi, a fascist, a communist. Basically, these are all heads of the Hydra that are connected to a single uh, demonic you know, entity, a single demonic intelligence. I also must say, though, that I'm not a Christian, you know, and I do have huge problems with religion, orthodox official religion. I think that they're custom made for psychopaths, and my work you know, looks into proving that. <laughs> I think they're kindergartens for psychopathy. I've mentioned <laughs> that, and I've even stated clearly the reasons why. And part of it is because they're based on hierarchy, like the different Masonic lodges. And therefore, I've learned cer certain metaphysical truisms and certain metaphysical rules of thumb that you can use. One of them is that if you see any entity or organization that is hierarchical in its nature, you should start being worried at that point. Because all the original Aryan, and I hope we get a chance to uh, define what that word really means, and also the Druidic organizations were not hierarchical. And most of the um, organizations, be they religious or corporate, that you see today are strictly hierarchical. And my mind goes back to even you know, the pretty recent book by Joel Bacan, The Corporation, in which he clearly defines corporations as psychopathic, meaning more specifically that the people who invent them and create them and fund them and work, behind the work, work in these corporations, they themselves are psychopathic. Obviously, a corporation can't be. He meant that the intelligences, the human intelligences, put these together. And slowly people are work waking up to this, that there's nothing healthy about these organizations and corporations. But the thing is that that organization, those organizations, including all the financial and economic organizations that plague the world today, are strictly hierarchical. And that alone is the definition, the hallmark of, you know, uh, dementia. It, and th these are then fallible because, and ultimately, they have an end by date. They're not part of civilization, neither are the religions. I believe that the people who are working in religion, you know, who tell us to not use our reason and just believe and have faith, this is what drives civilization into the ground. This is what stops civilization. So just there's some great, uh, I think it was Thomas Paine, who said that wherever there is a government in the world, you can be sure that there is no freedom. And he said that the, uh, the um, he's basically implying that governments and all these institutions are the bane of civilization. So when you hear these terms like civilization bandied around, you know, it's debatable whether we even have one because the pestilence that exists in man, his own toxic um, emotions, his vision of the world, his disconnect from nature, all of these things manifest in physical forms in the external world. The governments are part of it. They're part of the manifestation of a man's own inner temperament, which well, is not healthy. It's not in a good state. I like how James DeMeo defined civilization in his book, uh, Saharasia, which yeah. was defined as the civil, the civil treatments of others. It's beautiful, and I'm a big fan of his work. I was so glad to hear and listen to the interview that you did with him because I've been into Wilhelm Reich's work since I was a child and love uh, Saharasia. I mentioned it in my DVD series. He's got some very powerful points there. Um, it was a wonderful interview. I hope that people go and listen to him because he's one of the great teachers of our age and especially go from even DeMio's work straight into Wilhelm Reich because Reich for me was a, a real uh, huge mentor in the sense that he always, always, always pointed out the connections between the psychology of man and his environment. Now, of course, for Reich, even biology was psychology. The beauty, the absolute beauty of his work was that he said that the body physical is an extension of your consciousness. And, of course, the church doesn't like that because immediately as you go down that road, then you're talking about the freedom of the body how the body needs to be in this, um, uh, the relationship between consciousness and the human body is also one of the areas that's so toxic today. And of course, the churches uh, and all the religions are key in this. They have helped man to believe in the suppression of nature, the suppression of his natural instincts in his body. And so the Wilhelm Reichs of the world are you know, lethal to their, you know, their uh, mechanisms of control because he tries to show us that really the body is the temple of God and is an extension of your psychology. But DeMio uh, and their work, people really should know about it. It's absolutely key, that some of the key philosophies that but uh, you know, again, coming back to Thomas Paine, I mean, you know, the more perfect the civilization is, the less reason it will have for a government. And the converse then tells you what's going on. If you see these governments, and I don't care what kind of governments they are, these edifices will take the power away. And that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to keep man in a, uh, in a totally primitive, uncivilized state. You can never have civilization while these organizations exist. They're actually retroactive. Not just the John Allegro material, but the whole framework of understanding our ancient roots is, is of vital importance, especially in today's world. Um, I guess, you know, people know me. I'm from Ireland and I've written on Atlantis, the origins of evil and uh, astrotheology theology and uh, on the Irish origins of civilization, and people know me from these works. It's important, of course, that they realize that these are all connected works. They're not really different. Even the latest thing we're doing, you know, architects of control, when we're linking conspiracy theory with psychology. Uh, all the things I do are basically, again, you know, like your work in a way, it's, it's looking at the larger map, the, the whole movement of this 
It all ties together, doesn't it? Yeah, it all ties together. It's very syncretic. And um, um, so I don't look at just one area of my work as being divided or separate from another. Of course, my process began in Ireland, but during my years there, it was a little bit more focused on Irish mythology and uh, a little bit to do with uh, subversive symbolism. That's back in the, the 80s, the early 80s. But by the time I got to America, there's a welter of great speakers, great teachers. And so I just immersed myself in their work and slowly, you know, going through the Eustace Mullinses and the G. Edward Griffins and the Dr. Stan Monteiths and, the, you know, Webster Tarpleys, what have you, start to put together the bigger picture. And I think what's happened is that a lot of people now in, in the, the time we're living, more human beings, more masses, not just in America, but throughout the world, are starting to realize that, that political events specifically are orchestrated and they do fit a certain design or agenda or purpose. The next few years will be uh, more study for people. Uh, those who do know what's an agenda have to rightly identify what that agenda is. And they're not going to be able to do that. I don't really think they've done it so far. We're, we're quite a good long way. We're, we've made great progress, but we're not fully there yet yeah, because there's still a lot of finger pointing. There's still a lot of myopia. There's still a lot of fundamentalistic uh, perspectives. And this is, of course, I'm sure you've noticed that every little radio show, every little you know cabal, every little website, every speaker, they have their own little niche. And that's fine for in the beginning. But I think that the hungry student, this is what I get anyway, the feedback that comes to me, is that they're looking for that overarching agenda and, you know, it, it, does it come from Babylon, like uh, David Icke's are saying, you know, is it the British government, like some are saying, is it the Judaism, you know, is it the Jesuitism, is it the Vatican, you know, people are investigating and looking at all of these different uh, potentialities. And I think that's important because uh, we do see a little bit too much myopia, too, mi too much fundamentalism. We also see people trying to territorialize certain aspects of this knowledge, uh, and it can become a problem where a certain group, Christian or other, tries to step in and say, no, we have the whole truth here. We know what's going on, and if you even mention Guido von List or Madame Blavatsky or Alistair Crowley or Alfred Rosenberg or whoever, you know, especially in my work, I mentioned a wide variety of scholars from all different fields, suddenly they think they've got the number on you, you know, this kind of thing. So there's even dangers. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy to say it, but there's even dangers when you begin the investigation and you do it publicly. Oh, you're already sure. going to be lambasted, and you're already going to be you know, targeted by a bunch of people who you know, are label reading and have this particular prejudicial perspective. And I say to those people that if you have that prejudi prejudicial perspective you are never in a month of Sundays ever going to work out what's going on in the world exactly no and, and you know and my point is that even if somebody is a racist or whatever they may, may be does that somehow negate or make invalid every single bit of research they ever did yeah uh, exactly and you know in my, to explain what my point of view is that if you are a racist or a racialist I want to hear from you I want to hear from the Malcolm X's I don't mind listening to Muhammad Ali ranting on some sort of you know uh, interview I don't mind listening to you know, Elijah Muhammad. I don't mind listening to David Duke. I want to hear from all the points of view. I want to get my arms around all that information because there's elements of truth in all of it. But as I say, people invade this particular research community with dragging all their baggage with them, not realizing that the moment that you step into the world of conspiracy or alternative research, you are in an occult sphere of um, knowledge, whether you like it or not. So bringing all your you know, prejudicial baggage with you is the most counterproductive thing that can happen, <laughs> and it, it will not last. It will not last. We have to listen to it and study all the different angles of this incredible uh, hybrid. And that's basically what my focus was, and I did that. I did it as the Romans do. When I came to America, I didn't bring my you know, little prejudices uh, with me. I left them at the door and tried to look into all sorts of areas, New Age and other Christian. You know, in fact, I keep telling this to people who are talk to me from the Christian movement. I mean, I'd say that 80% of the original researchers that I studied, and many of them even in Ireland, were Christian. You're, you're, yeah, you're cutting out just a little bit. You said original research were Christian? Yeah, the original research that I studied, and those who had the biggest influence on me, and many of them who were even personal mentors, such as uh, Professor Paul Keane and Professor Lewis, and also Professor you know, George McDonald. You, you cut out again. Professor who? Uh, Lewis. C.S. Lewis. Okay. Yeah, these individuals were, for me, uh, extraordinary in, in the way that they spoke about history in the world. And even though they came from a particular mindset, you know, they didn't let that limit their overall understanding of the matrix of power. So again, I encourage a lot of people to do that. And I'm seeing that, again, as I said before, there's, people are now waking up. I, I say there's a huge demographic of people right now all across the world who do understand that everything they see on the news, everything they read in the newspapers, is, especially in the, as I said, the political milieu, is orchestrated, it has an agenda. The next few years is just going to be people to sift through the information, do their homework, and find out what agenda. You know, of course, I come from the point of view that it started in Atlantis, moved through Egypt. I call the conspiracy an atonist conspiracy. Uh, and that's okay, people can you know, read up what I've done and see if that makes sense to them. Uh, or they can just stick with what they uh, you know, want to believe, where there's you know, neo-Nazi or neo-con or you know, <laughs> demo-con or whatever they, they're looking at. There's a process of understanding, there's a relationship with knowledge. It's not just about gaining the knowledge, it's actually about having a relationship with the knowledge and, and, and also being very skeptical uh, about what we read and what we see and forming people, people have to form their own conclusions.
But to me, it's absolutely a spiritual work. It's absolutely eclectic. It could be bigger than all of us even know. And we are in an era, in a, literally a time frame, a generation where is, is unique in, in the history of the world because our forefathers, even one generation ago, couldn't ask these questions, uh, didn't ask these questions, and the few who did, uh, including the John Allegros and others like him, were you know assassinated professionally, and their works have been suppressed. So I have no time, zero tolerance for those people you know who, who come along with this very, very territorialistic and negative attitude towards this kind of research. Uh, and I never lose sight of the time that we're in and how precious it is. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the mystery schools and what they were involved in? Well, of course, there's many, and I would say that most of them were corrupt. So those people who, who are a bit suspicious of many of the mystery schools, especially those of the modern age, you know, they, they have a point. I'm not negating that. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, when you start researching these things, it's important to be able to see what was positive about it and what also got corrupted. The original mystery schools, of course, those who existed on the Nile, those who, that existed perhaps in Chaldea and Babylon and so forth, these were always um, put together by the Stellar cult which is basically the oldest religious institution in the world. And that was uh, their big thing, of course, was astrology. And their other important subject that they taught was uh, geomancy, that the Earth was a living being and that you were an extension of the Earth. So the key of what they taught in the mystery schools was very powerful. And it was about that. Imagine, you know, you've heard a lot of talk of auras, of course, and even sure. uh, John Belchizedek and others of sure. talk about the Merkaba, the human Merkaba. Well, what the ancient mystery schools were teaching is that the self of a man and nature are connected. Nature is really the aura, if you will, of man's selfhood. So when man is looking for his selfhood, he's actually staring at it every day and doesn't realize it. It's like the line from Tennyson's poem. Um, it's, it's like the, the microcosm and the macrocosm. And, and since you mentioned uh, Drun Valno, uh, then I guess you might as well go, you know, not forget to mention the tree of life and the, and the flower of life as well. Yeah. Yes, the seed of life, the tree of life. Uh, this is why they used a lot of organic vegetal symbolism. And that's originally why even Druidic mystery schools were outdoors. The Druids never had their colleges of learning indoors. They always had it outdoors so that you could see the trees, you could see the, feel the elements, and you could observe the stars. They were the starry temples of old. And, of course, um, we have a mystery school today, which is the church. And even though the Protestant religion has tried to sanitize their version of the religion in order to sort of downsize its uh, downplay of the pagan elements, yeah, no matter how you sanitize it, it won't work because obviously there's pagan elements and there's even works coming out every single month proving this, you know, that even there's Judaic religion is not free of its pagan elements. It all links back to either Egyptian paganism or to dru Druidic paganism and there's nothing that can be done about that. Anyone who doubts this can do the homework. Don't believe what we're saying. Go and look at the edifices. Go and look at the mosaics. Go look at the architecture. Um, look at the meanings of, of the words like we're saying and start to understand that these new sort of quote-unquote mystery schools their modus operandi, of course, is different, to be specific. The fraternity structures within schools and the military, the fraternity structure within the seminaries, the fraternity systems within the secret orders and secret societies have a reason for that hierarchical structure. And it's the reverse of what the Druids used to do, which is they are filtering out good men. They're filtering out moral men. In the place of virtue and morality, they'll give you status, money, wealth, and power. But behind those people, you see, is the rot, the, the toxicity or the obsession uh, of uh, basically what I believe is a sort of an alien proclivity, but without even getting into that, just keeping it in a in layman's context, we just see that the tremendous hypocrisy and, and the non-virtue that, that is happening there, because these organizations and the structure is there to gut it. And secondly, they have a second function, which is to prevent good men from rising. Good men will obviously join, and that's why I don't like bashing these organizations, because that's far, far too limited in understanding. Good men might be, for whatever reason, attracted to theosophy, attracted to masonry, uh, as, a, as a good man is often attracted to Christianity or religion. But what they don't realize until it's often too late and many of the case histories of Freemasonry prove this to be the point. We have whistleblowers from within inside who will tell you exactly what went on and confirm exactly what I'm saying, which is that they didn't make any progress. That the, and it's just like the same story in a corporation. You try to bunk the system or bring true morality in there, and you'll soon find that they've given you your marching orders. And Ron Paul, he said it. He says, when one gets into bed with government, you better expect the diseases that it spreads. And he's absolutely right. And so are the big questions of, of uh, the age that we're living in right now is how do we dispense? Because a lot of people go, hey, Michael, what about the solutions? You know, uh, uh, you know let's, let's talk about solutions as if I never mentioned solutions. My work is full of solutions, but you still get these people who haven't read your work telling you that you haven't given them any solutions. Then I turn around to them as I did recently and say, look, isn't the solution the same as identifying the problem and removing it? So if, if my work or anybody's work who works in this field is helping you to identify the problem or problems, that is the solution. But again, people want you to you know, install it in their brain, which is the same colonialization, the same victimhood, 
that we're finding in the world. You know, so they turn to us as if we're going to sort of install something or lead them or be their teachers or gurus or whatever. And yet the whole message is to free yourself from the chains of this kind of allegiance. And it seems that you know, people have a great difficulty with that. But um, you know, it's like T.S. Eliot said, a man, you know, humankind can't bear very much reality. And I'd say that uh, you were asking about my, how I got into this and my experience. I'd say now after, because I started about 1982, after all these years, I basically have really understood deeply what T.S. Eliot was talking about. Man cannot bear much reality. It's simply not something he can handle. He has his ideas, he has his ideas of reality, but he's not able to really deal too much with, the, with reality as it really is. And we have to be very, very aware of that, that man is infirm, he's fragmentary, he gets very anxious, he's not really capable of, uh, of really understanding you know, the way things work in the world. And again, within all of these religions and within the mystery schools is the seed of truth, but the seed has been perverted or mis misinterpreted. It has to be there. If it's not there, they can't lure you because they know that subconsciously man wants the truth. So by using the iconography, a very mystical iconography, I, I might add, by using certain talismanic words and by uh, the promise. I talk about this in volume two of the Irish Origins, of a whole chapter on this idea of the promise, the promise, the promise, that the authority figure above you, be he Constantine, be he God, be he whoever, you know, is gonna promise you a future paradise or whatever, and then people get into lockstep. There, there's, a, there's also, like you implied earlier on, that there's a reason for why people will dumb themselves down, uh, why they'll be you know, blindly obedient and so forth and so on. They're being given a certain glowing promise, and under that guise, they will literally murder your enemies for you and do all sorts of other atrocities in the world. What they won't do is they won't question where all of that iconography comes from. You know, they talk about being born again. You know, where does that term come from? Don't they know that that was a key part of the Druidic mysteries about dying and being born again? Even when you talk about the alchemy and the chemical wedding, the chemical wedding implies that you have to have a first a chemical divorce in which you have to die to all the things of the world, be renamed, rebaptized, and reborn again. Or they'll talk about, you know, Yahweh and Elohim without even knowing where these words came from, that they represent trees and they represent ancient sacred cults. And they represent the feminine principle. Both those words end with a feminine um, suffix and therefore are feminine in nature. And yet God is always portrayed as a man. You know? So when you start opening the ball of wax, then the truth, of course, will come out. But uh, it's, of course, as we have always pointed out, you know, truth is very threatening to those people who have an idea of reality and to which they hold on with grim death. What we're seeing now, and one can use even astrological parlance by talking about the presence of Pluto or perhaps even the age of awakening, the Maya theory, whatever you want to put out it. But basically, outside all of the uh, rhetoric, what it really means is that we are in an age of awakening in which those particular ideas of reality and those particular prejudices are going to be shaken up, whether you like it or not. That's what's happening. And so there will be a dividing of the sheep from the goats, of those people who really, really can live for truth and, and discover the preciousness of freedom, and those people who just simply will not be able to get it, and who will run towards the, the controllers saying, give us your global village, give us that authority, give us that uh, stability and security. You know, I think it was, um, I can't remember exactly who said it, but they, I think it was a French philosopher who said that, you know, uh, tyranny is always much better organized than freedom and there's great wisdom behind that because again it has that orderliness and uh, the man who doesn't want to be free or the man who's looking for freedom from freedom will literally run to be an inhabitant of that uh, in that uh, you know incarceration be it cyber or, or some other kind they've done it all through the years they've done it through the millennium and what they don't realize is that it's the most toxic and disorganized people who keep on bleeding about you know new world order they're the most disgustingly disorganized people when it comes to morals and also spirituality and therefore they talk about, it's like a man who's lost the power of his legs. He requires the braces, which are artificial in nature and are stapled on from outside. Man psychologically is doing exactly the same thing. He's looking for those crutches. One of the topics that you bring up often in your research is the Aryans. Would you like to discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, the first thing is you know, the definition of the term. I can hardly think of a term that's been more misused and misapplied, uh, although there are so many. But in my work over the last uh, few years, it's been number one on the list. Um, basically, in a nutshell, it, it derives from the name of a goddess that either was A-R-I, Ari, or E-R-I, Ari. And this is where you find that word root in terms like terra, you know, like terra firma, the earth, and in hira, which is the top of the Greek pantheon. It just happens to have that. And even in words like tara, and teri, and terra, you know, terra, of course, being you know, in the Bible, so-called forefather. We have to understand that part of the propaganda was to masculinize the feminine, just like was done in the, in the Bible. In Ashira, in Assyria, Syria, you know, all of these different terms that bear her title. And the man of wisdom who worshipped the, the goddess, and she was just a personification of the stars and, the sky, and the, also the earth, of course, uh, they were known as the Arya. It, it, it represents, uh, it's one of its secondary meanings is the West, the Western islands or the Western lands. It represents the pure ones, the noble ones. But most importantly, when you're dealing with the reinterpretation of that word, is to just completely not, to completely emphasize that it has nothing to do with race. I think that solves the problem right there. 
and that all the squabbling for years has been basically again a product of little knowledge uh, because as I said we, we, as we were talking earlier you know etymology or whatever may not be a precise science but that that doesn't mean that we can't be extremely um, cognizant and reverent towards the secret meaning of words in the sense that the words will betray a great deal of information and words like uh, we've already mentioned David and the Tudors and the Toots you know this is this is legit this is legitimate and it opens up a great many doors one of the things that it does of course is show that lots of type lots of things that we take as personal names like Solomon Jacob David Abraham Joseph um, Isaac they're not actually names at all they were titles specifically the term David was the commander's name the Toots of Egypt that prefects really meant that they were commanders of David. That David was a commander. In fact, they mentioned this in the Bible, that David's job was a commander. Not personal David, David as a man, but David would have been a title given to all commanders who were both priestly in one dimension of their role, and also, secondly, they were you know, champions of the people and often military commanders or leaders. That was what a David was. It was never a personal name. And one of the great uh, elements of deception, and I list many of these in Volume 2 of the Irish Origins book, is one of them is the mis- it, one of them is the turning of personal names into titles, and also then the turning of titles into personal names. It's, it's incredible when you get into it. It's just one of the keys. And uh, the word Aryan, of course, the, the, the uh, sort of um, misapplication of that word goes even further. It's been so maligned. And the Arya originally were from the West, and that specifically means Britain and also Scandinavia. That's where the word Teutons comes from, Teutons, because the very elements that you find within the pantheon, cosmology, and religion of Egypt themselves, and this includes the building of the pyramid and the Sphinx, originated in the West. Scrolls were even found in Egypt that said that, in which the term Arya was used as the title, and again, not the name, but the title of the man who designed the pyramid. Part of that title was Ari, man of the Ari. And uh, that was understood to be that he was a disciple of Horus, a Shamsu Hor, one of the, you know, the blue-eyed or green-eyed Westerners. So there's nothing bizarre about this at all. And in times to come, it'll be considered completely normal. Once, once they've dug up a few more tombs over there in China or whatever, a few more graves, even the academic world will just have to, you know, grit their teeth and bear it that you know, white men from the West got into the East, and they're going to have to sink their teeth into the fact that they even brought many of the elements of culture. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not some you know, uh, extremist that says <laughs> the, West was, the East was primitive, and uh, you know, men from the West brought every element of culture. But what I am saying is what the Eastern adepts say, right out of their own horse's mouth, that these were not invaders, as we put before us in these um, duplicitous history books. These were migrants. Mi- they, in fact, they were welcomed adepts. They lived side by side, the Aryan, I, uh, or the local indigenous people on the Indus and Sarasvati River. The total lies have been told to us about the Aryan invasion, so-called of India. They lived in Cappadocia, they lived in Turkey, Anat- Anatolia. And by the way, uh, Anatolia, that's Turkey, is from a, bi- from a um, botanical point of view, from a, from a geographical point of view, and from a, um, basically, um, from every point of view that you can imagine of science, is considered a Western country, by the way. Today it's only certain prejudice that leaves it everywhere east of the Balkans is east. As a matter of fact, Turkey and almost all of its scientific senses is considered to this day still a western country so the Scythian groups you see in these proto uh, celtic groups uh, just to be very clear for people um, again because it, in volume one in the introduction i try to clear up the meaning of these terribly misused words like celtic and gaelic and what have you uh, celtic is another one of the most misused terms it was mostly used by romans and it just meant something like barbarian basically anyone that the romans hadn't conquered yet or anyone whose religion they didn't understand they just called it celtic so it's one of the most broadest and most useless terms you can imagine, and certainly had no application to the tribes themselves. They would not have used that term. There was only one term. There was only one tribe, I mean. And they were called the Keltoi, with a K, K-E-L-T-O-I, that perhaps used a term similar to that, uh, to define themselves. In every other instance, and I don't care if you're talking about Turkey, or the Ukraine, or Spain, or even Ireland then later, you know. In fact, it's now been discovered, amazingly, that the Celts were a very late group into Ireland, and that, that, that the ancestral people of Ireland were absolutely 100% proven, even with DNA evidence, We'll talk about this in volume one. We're not Celtic. Well, then the story rises. What were they, you see? Well, these were the megalithic people that is best called uh, the Arya. And th- they took their name from their land, the land of the West, the land of the goddess Ari. And um, their elements were welcomed, not only because of the way they looked. And if people really find it hard to get their mind around this, then, you know, maybe they should go to the East. Because the, the appearance of tall, pale, blonde men and women with golden red hair or even uh, blonde hair and many in the ancient days those tribes uh, used to dye their hair or not dye but they'd use lime to even further whiten their hair the, the appearance of such people in the eastern lands was really something to behold and th- that alone needs to be focused on and whether they're called Dorians you know or Archaeans again the linguists and the various archaeologists 
working mostly for the Vatican over 100 years ago, they've done a right you know, job of work to make sure we don't find these hidden connections of who these people are. But I'm glad to see that in modern days, a lot of evidence is now coming out practically by the month to confirm you know, what, what I've been talking about and what my mentors like Collins Beaumont and Conor McDarry have been talking about. So the idea is that it's not the name of a, ra a race at all, but it certainly was the term that was used for a caste, a caste of elders, a caste of uh, enlighteners. Um, and they moved west approximately 13,500 years ago, not by choice, but because of the, the cataclysms that happened in the west, which were absolutely severe, very, very severe. These included tsunamis. These included enormous devastation of the earth, not in the uniformitarian way that, again, has been taught in the schools, but in this cataclysmic way. And evidence, again, is coming to light that Ireland was wrecked as the north of Scotland, Argyllshire, certainly Norway. And in fact, in Norwegian mythology and Norwegian um, history, they even know something about something that's called the Storega tsunami. Stor is a Scandinavian word meaning big or large. So the, the huge tsunami that took place just on the east, the west coast of Norway, in between Scotland. And that wrecked the land bridges that existed between northern Scotland and Scandinavia. So when we talk about the Arya, we're talking about the proto Teutons, and we're talking about a group called the Goths. And uh, in Scandinavian languages, the G is often pronounced like a Y, so it's really the, the, the word get, is, which meant goat, is pronounced like yet. And then this, turn, this word group turns up in, uh, in China. It turns up in northern India with a people called the Jats. The Jats Sikhs, who is an ag agricultural elite, a warrior elite. Are, and uh, in their physiology, you can tell that they're westernized. They themselves agree that they were westernized, that their ancestors were from the west or the northwest. And the terminology and the etymology confirms it too, that these Goths or Gets or what have you, the man of the goat, the people of the goat, uh, you know, we're a widespread college. There's phenomenal evidence of this. And uh, the word Arya or RE can be found in the words like aristocracy. You know, again, representing in its purest form that these people were a sort of an aristocracy. They were basically identical to the stellar cults of the ancient world.